Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will start uh, our second session. Uh, and uh, so the title of our second session uh, is Design, Heritage and Accessibility. So I may you allow me to say a few words. I wanted to say that uh, I'm Alfredo Siomantas. I'm working for State Department for Cultural Heritage Protection under the Ministry of Culture in Lithuania. And uh, I want to say that I'm not at all architect. I'm not at all designer. And, um, but I'm working for the State Department and especially in the field of international cooperation, Europe, Europe, European affairs. And uh, I'm dealing with a uh, number of other uh, projects. And uh, I would like to just to remind you a little bit about the context of this conference. Uh, that this uh, conference is uh, continuity of attempt and effort of uh, EU member states to put cultural heritage at EU level concern. So it, it started uh, by the different movements, uh, by creation of the European Heritage Heads Forum, uh, uh, other organiza uh, organization during Belgian presidency, uh, it was decided uh, uh, to create uh, the platform for cooperation for EU and cultural heritage. And after it was several uh, presidencies who took the, who choose the team of cultural heritage and tried to show uh, importance and uh, potential of cultural heritage. It happened, uh, it happened in Lithuania in 2013, we, where we tried to find the place of cultural heritage in agriculture um, field, in uh, environment, social cohesion. Then it was a uh, turn of Greece presidency, where they have been speaking about, more about towns uh, uh, and um, enlarge the scale. Then came the, the case of Italy, where all the, during the Italian presidency, all the uh, uh, sector of tourism was added. And today we are in Riga, and we are lead, dealing with very specific, a little bit uh, technical uh, approach on cultural heritage, contemporary architecture, and design. So, I'm very, very uh, pleased and, and I would like to thank Latvian authorities by bringing us together and by giving us the possibility to speak and to go deeper in the subject. And today, today we have a huge pleasure. We, we participated in the first meeting. We, we saw this Danish, uh, Swedish, Estonian approach and then we switched a little bit to the accessibility in the same time, and it's enormous pleasure to present you Martin, uh, Martin Vosleitner Leitner, uh, from Austria, and he's, uh, he's uh, um, information designer with business administration background. He's a speaker on the, of the board uh, design Austria, and he uh, he ran his own design office in Austria. So, Martin, please. A very late good morning, um, Labrit, and uh, just a question to you: um, Can you understand me? Good. Uh, second question, uh, who of you is uh, Latvian? One, two, three, four. Okay, thank you. So, um, for those of Latvians, um, I, um, I will show some picture of Latvia, which is just a subset. For all the others, you will have a more detailed insight in the daily life of Latvia, which does not mean that every Latvian behaves like this, but there had been some examples and realities which showed up like that. Um, a very famous lady of Austria, her name might be... Sissi, yeah? Who else, yeah? This is our cultural heritage, and uh, this is the contemporary expression of today. 
So you see um, preservation is the one thing, but development is the other thing. And uh, everyone familiar with this lady or man, but in that case it's a lady, yeah, Conchita. And uh, basically she really changed, she changed uh, not only Austria, but I think also part of Europe. And um, it changed our mayor and our whole community. So thanks to that cultural heritage. Um, in, uh, I, I know some very nice ladies from uh, Latvia, Agnese, Naina, and Barbara, and I just asked them about uh, what might be very typical Latvian. And of course, the very first answer is food and eating. So uh, I'm, I don't want to destroy the beautiful language, so I only say it's the potato pancake. Uh, fried from freshly grated potato. It's of course the black rye bread. It's the uh, how you say piragi, piragi, piragi. Okay. <laughs> the long is a, a little uh, longer story about smoked speck, uh, but delicious. Then we have this. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Um, of the Kulland region, and then there's the fresh cheese from Summer Solistis with common fresh milk, sour milk, eggs, common. Please don't miss that. But the winner was 12 points to uh, Pilekia Sirni, or how, how you pronounce it the right way? Which one? Palaki Sirni. Okay, that's it. And uh, it seems this was the winner of this investigation. And a great piece with the spread of the fried speck and, um, and onions for the winter time. And we asked uh, some people about what's the real special way and what's the expertise to make it really, really good. And uh, one of the answers was, uh, actually they are not gray, but they are brown. And uh, they are um, somehow typical for the region and um, we didn't met the men anywhere elsewhere. And, uh, one lady said, we trench them in water a day before cooking, then it really, really gets good. So, um, this in mind, um, we come back to some people we met before. This is uh, uh, a group of very nice students we met last year uh, in Riga, and uh, this is another group we met again in Jurmala. Uh, unfortunately, without uh, Gina Lolo Brigida, she was not there. And um, we come back to these people and ask them uh, basically two questions. First of all, is there anything very typical Latvian you have learned from your grandparents? And uh, the second question was, of course, why are these grey, but basically brown peas, why might it be so cool and uh, so important? Um, and then, of course, send us a picture which has a value and some relevance and importance for you. Um, as design students, this is, this is the uh, common sense and this is the basic outcome and the baseline of uh, the Belekia Zirni. It is, if you eat the peas, there's no reason to cry in the upcoming year. Um, so, uh, nobody should die in the family and uh, it will be a happy year, so it's, very, it's a very nice and very simple to understand recipe. Eat as many as possible of this piece and luck for the whole year coming up. Yeah. Um, this is, a, by the way, a very nice information design from Darze and uh, also her sentence that it is a kind of Christmas tradition and uh, it should be one of the 12 dishes of the junkets her point of view. Um, these are the grandparents of Guna, Indulis and Irina, and they are already uh, expertise in the grey peas. They say, uh, well, on the hundredth day in the upcoming year, you're going to plant them. I don't know. S someone can confirm that? That's, that's the very, very special way. And uh, in the minimum 50 shades of grey, with an A and not with an E. Um, then we had uh, Christina and Tamara, and um, here we have, um, what did you inherit, what's your cultural heritage from your grandparents? And she said, well, the importance of gardening skills, 
than uh, with all the vegetables. Secondly, the importance of uh, going to the cemetery. And then, of course, in the third level, um, we talked about uh, the great peace, and she said, well, uh, she's not sure whether it's a Christmas tradition or a New Year's Eve tradition, but at the end, we had the same meaning, uh, eat and don't cry. Um, all the pictures you see, they are not Photoshop edited. It's just the real life, what you can see over there. This is Anya and Anastasia, and uh, she said, well, <laughs> Uh, first, when I was young, I didn't like it, but then, later on, I really appreciate grandma's recipe of a beet soup. And now it's my favorite one. And uh, we met uh, Agnese and uh, her grandparents, and she said, well, you can travel all over the world, stay in many places for some time, but you should always come back, because this is our home, and it's the best one for us, Latvia. Um, our wits, tall guy, um, and uh, he has the story of uh, <laughs> make, make spring a little bit early in Latvia, fake spring with the help of onions, which are put in a jar filled with water uh, in the window, and then you have a spring feeling already very, very early in March, April, or May. And um, then, of course, uh, we had um, Agrita and her grandfather, and another aspect of uh, being in nature, walking on the seaside, walking in the woods, and uh, she said that's something very Latvian she inherited. And uh, Christina and Walter, and she said, well, it's the diligence, a very important part of a good person, and I think the diligence is very typical for the habitat of a real Latvian. Annette and uh, Sintra, and now we are back in this singing uh, passion and tradition of Latvia. She is a people who keeps alive the many-voiced singing in our family. And uh, then we just had another uh, a change of perspective and uh, asked simply, well, what did you learn, not from your grandparents, but what did you learn from your grandchildren? And then Irina said, well, I have learned to understand that my age and my experience does not always mean that I'm allowed to give them advice. And uh, then some uh, more, uh, again, uh, singing from my grandparents. I have heard songs and fairy tales, lullabies and games, Daina and Erika. And uh, finally, we back to very daily life that Maris and his brothers and fathers said, well, how to prepare a slaughtered pig for, some com for consumption? Um, essential thing for good food. You have seen the long list before. And uh, then I, I have to experience that on the countryside. I never heard it, but uh, Agnes told us that I have learned also some rituals. When you leave your rural house with your car, you make three long beeps with your car at the end of your small road before you turn on the big road. I don't know whether it's typical Latvian and they're still doing it, but it would be nice to watch that. Is there someone of you doing that still? Your grandparents? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you see? <laughs> Where do you come from? From Lithuania. From Lithuania, okay. <laughs> neighborhood. So it, it seems a, a common thing between <coughs> Latvia and Lithuania. Uh, you also do that? <laughs> or only when you're in Latvia? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Um, this is just some impressions. And uh, the basic questions we have to to ask ourselves and uh, to ask uh, those who are very close to us in the family is, of course, uh, it's not only that we know that the grandparents have all the stories, knowledge, skills, competences, experiences, um, but the question is how to give and how to receive, or in the point of view in the middle, how to receive and how to transmit to the next generation. Um, Unfortunately, life is fast. Um, not only uh, that the speed um, is accelerating day by day, um, it would be very comfortable and, and lazy to say, well, I sit down and wait until the young people pop by and then I will tell my stories. 
um, perhaps also the other generation has to speed up a little bit and uh, try to, um, to find a common basis, a common touch point with the young people. Like Irina said, well, I also have learned from my grandson. <coughs> Um, and the question is how to design, how to organize these points of transition, not in the museum, but in daily life. Um, and it's about this point, like in the sports, where you handle the relay. How can we create an atmosphere? How we can make it easy? And easy means in the sense of how to enter these touch points but also how to escape by time. It's nice to be with your grandparents half an hour. It might be a nightmare five hours. Um, so we have to understand that uh, respect has also a time frame which fits to both of them. And how can we have uh, a situation, an atmosphere, to give importance to the things we have, and on the other hand, to understand and appreciate and the dimensions of the value which is handled over. Um, I think it's almost the definition of any discipline now, uh, but of course also in the field of design, design we understand as a platform for social interaction. It's not about the coffee cup, but it's about how much fun we have if we share a coffee together. That's the sense of the coffee cup. Of course it has to be functional, but ah, it's okay to drink the coffee alone. It has a lot of more fun if we share the coffee together. Italians are one of the best examples for that. Um, so of course the role of design is always not to solve the problems, but to create these platforms, like in theater. It's not about that we are the director of the piece, we are not the writer, we are not the actors, but we build the theater. We make it as nice, as relevant, as beautiful as possible, so that everyone can understand and feel the value of what happens here. We make it comfortable, we make it accessible, we make it uh, universal design, we make it in a design for all aspect. We have a nice cafeteria, we have a wardrobe, we have some toilets, Whatever we need, it has a nice temperature, but we don't play. We just offer the platform. That's the basic role of design. Another very nice sentence from the land of design um, from Japan, Soichiro Fukutaki said, use what exists to create what is to be. Don't look in, uh, I mean, in Latvia, there's a lot of wood. Well, I think 100, 110% of the surface is covered with wood. And uh, then we use what exists and we don't go for something high mountains for skiing in Latvia. That's not the topic. It's about wood. So always we use those things which are available, which are reachable, which are not only available but which are typical, authentic. It's this locality which we can, this identity, which can build on and which we can rely on. Um, and this, <coughs> perhaps also in the museum, but uh, I don't know whether it's easier, but it's more possible in the family, in public life, but especially in daily life. Um, and the question is, if we think about the touch points and we think about Tamara again, if these two young ladies whether Latvians, Lithuanians, Americans, Japanese, or whatever, how can we link this local touch we are looking for when we are traveling? How can we link in our search of our own identity? How can we find a way to connect with Tamara? What are the possibilities? How much scenario we need that we are in a good position, in a good atmosphere, open, to talk to Tamara, but not only us as a visitor or a neighbor, but also in the sense of Tamara. This is not Rundale. Perhaps it's a new Rundale, I don't know. Um, it's, a, it's an old people house in uh, Gulbene city. Gulbene, I think, is uh, in the east of Riga, in the eastern part of Latvia, 
maybe, yes. And uh, this is the palace of uh, Gulbene. But, um, and old people house, I know, they look everywhere the same. Whether it's Latvia, whether it's Austria, whether it's, uh, perhaps Japan is different. But I think in, in Germany, and I know a lot of houses like this, perhaps in a different design, but in the, in the same tonality, in the same atmosphere, and uh, looking like this, and uh, looking like this, which is much more cozy than yesterday in, in Rundale um, for living. And um, of course, we have here met um, Skytritte. Skytritte. Um, she, she has a twin brother, and uh, Imans. And uh, his brother has two boys, now already 60 years old. And uh, they, um, they are uh, in the local bakery working. She has had a daughter. Her daughter died with, um, when she was uh, one years old. So she said she has had to work hard not to cry. She was more than 40 years teacher for chemistry, biology, and geography. And she has had a passion for arts. And she learned weaving and sewing and ceramics and basketry. And um, now she is in Gulbini City. Can you imagine the potential of cultural heritage in only this one person about Latvia? And I think that's the point of design. Uh, what we have to do is to find ways how to get in touch and how not to lose this cultural heritage of Skadrita. What kind of accessibility, what kind of setups, what kind of tonality, what, what degree of coolness we would need, and how much fun we could have with Skadrita. In the respect of her life, in the respect of her person, in the experiences she has, and all the stories she can tell. I think it's, it's the task of design as a platform for interaction to make these people speak, to make these people understand, but also on the other hand, to give an understanding why these stories are relevant and coming back to Irina's grandson, huh, slow down, yeah? just the age and your experience does not mean automatically I will be listened. Perhaps to work on both sides. In that sense, police. That's it. So, uh, one more fast test. Um, Sorry, um, you, uh, it's just a platform. Perhaps you can put in what you have learned from your grandparents, what was relevant for your life, and perhaps you can also put in on the other side uh, for your own children, your neighbors, for the next young generation, out of your context and setup, what kind of values, stories, um, perhaps even tragedies, whatever it might be, important, relevant things in life, very, very short, what would you like to transmit to uh, the next to keep the cultural heritage? To make it easy, there is a QR code on the back, you can scan it, then you're automatically on the website, otherwise it's the website uh, which is mentioned on the back. Just upload for the sake of fun, for the sake of identity, for a kind of dialogue. Um, the organizers will decide how do we handle these millions of entries and uh, maybe they are part of the documentation. It's not only about Latvia, we also have uh, the category about where you come from, from the country, um, to have a deeper understanding that this was, this was Italian and not from the Latvian people. Okay, that's it. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. If uh, uh, auditorium has questions. No questions. Okay, then I have uh
Uh, I have uh, one question to you, Martin. Martin? Yes. Uh, uh, when we started to be in touch a little bit by email, uh, I have asked uh, about references, and you referred to very important, I think, um, uh, your work, uh, so-called espresso. Okay. May you tell us a little bit because uh, about espresso and where to find espresso? Okay. Um, yes. <laughs> Pete, Pete knows where to find espresso. There are only, um, unfortunately, only two places in all Europe. The one is Italy, the other one is Portugal. Uh, they have the real espresso. Um, all the others are fake espresso. Um, yes, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> There's a common understanding on the floor here. No, uh, espresso is just a metaphor. And the metaphor is, uh, you have an understanding of Italian espresso? Huh? Long or short? Very, very short. Yeah. Oh, there's an Italian lady in the back. <laughs> yes, very, very short. Okay. Uh, strong or weak? <coughs> strong. Yeah. Um, if you think about the mocker machine, easy or difficult? Easy. Huh? Done. Yeah. And in most of the cases, uh, sweet. And this should be information design. Strong, which means excellent beans. Uh, the better the data, the better the presentation. Uh, short, please don't bore with 500 pages what you can say in five sentences. No, in five words. Don't bore with a two hours presentation where uh, the outcome is one sentence. Uh, um, easy to make. If this system is so difficult that we can't change in 10 seconds, then it was not simply enough to meet the needs. If I need a machine which costs 5,000 euro to make an espresso, pff, nice. But better the mocha machine of Bialetti with around 17 euro or something like that. Yeah? Simple. And of course, sweet, and sweet is nothing else than the metaphor for uh, aesthetics, beauty of life. And that's the espresso. And you promise you never forget the metaphor of espresso now. Yes? Good. Thanks. It's not the Café Americano, yeah? No, it's the espresso. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Martin. And uh, to those who are interested in, uh, in, um, in espresso, it's so-called a brief reference to information design. So if you Google, maybe you will find. So thank you very much. And I want to just to introduce a uh, fourth uh, member of our, uh, our uh, today's company is Marianne Lechtemicki, who is coming from Finland, and she, is, uh, she has a duty today to help us to report or to the plenary session, because it, it will, we will come back and uh, Marianne will report what happened in our two uh, sessions. And uh, I just remind you that yesterday, uh, and even um, uh, it was uh, distributed the final uh, joint statement of the conference. And uh, having this in mind, I would like to remind you that there is at least four or five uh, points relating to importance of design that, and accessibility and uh, cultural heritage. So, uh, yeah, please think about uh, by, by, uh, the, the final document when you listen our uh, speakers <coughs> and uh, how they reflect and if they enough fit it into the final uh, uh, document. So, and now uh, we go to our next speaker and it's uh, very uh, uh, honor uh, to present you Pete Kircher, who is coming uh, from uh, uh, Italy, <laughs> who is ambassador, who is lawyer, and who is a member of Italian Association of Industrial uh, Design, who is founder of uh, Design for All, who is a member of, uh, I don't know how many destinies, of uh, scientific consulting editorial uh, committees. So, floor is, floor is yours, please. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you also to Martin for giving this introduction about coffee. <clears throat> Sorry, Martin, just one correction. It's not called espresso. It's called coffee. Everything else is called dirty water. <laughs> Let's get things right eh, from the beginning. Um, I'm at something of a disadvantage in that I only managed to arrive here yesterday evening, very late. Uh, I had a commitment yesterday in Frankfurt uh, where I was judging in the design award uh, in the bathroom fair, a design award for bathrooms for uh, changing generations. Uh, I had given this commitment already many, uh, many months ago and so it wasn't possible for me to be there yesterday. And so to graft what I'm saying onto what I should be doing that is, what, I, what, what, what happened yesterday, I can't do that because I didn't hear anything yesterday. Uh, so I had, um, I, I tried to think, what can I do to make a generic presentation that will be of some interest to you without having the faintest idea what you've already heard? Now, the first thing, anyway, I, I want to thank Martin for another thing. He did the first step in a design process, which was to ask about you. Uh, so at least now I have an idea of how many of you are native from Latvia. Uh, and that helps because, you know, when you're doing a design process, the first thing you have to understand is the people you're designing for. If you don't care about the people you're designing for, you're not a designer, you're an artist. That's fine. I've got no problems with being an artist. I've got lots of respect for artists as well. But artists do their thing and designers do, a, do something different. Designers do things for people who are targeted. So before... I go any further, I, got, I have to have one or two more ideas about the audience so that I can try to address my remarks through what I'm going to show you to be relevant to you as an audience. I know half of you roughly come from Latvia. Um, I'd like to get an idea how many of you are actually architects or designers uh, or both. So would you tell me please if you're an architect? Okay. Is there anybody who is a designer who is not an architect? That does happen sometimes in some countries. You have my sympathy. I, I have the same situation. This morning during the session I had to go out because otherwise I would have disturbed everybody. <clears throat> um, I do need to have an idea about the sort of work that the rest of you do. Are you museum curators? Uh, please tell me. Uh, shout out what you do. Okay. Okay. Where? Design Museum here in Latvia. Is that on the other side of the river in the... Where is it? Ah. Is that new? Really? I've been here about ten times and I've never been to your museum. That's not good. Ah. Uh -huh. Oh, hang on. No, yes, maybe I have been there. Yes, <laughs> yes. With, uh, with, with Dinah, uh, who was also on, uh, Martin's, uh, on, on Martin's presentation, with Dinah Vitolina. Um, and the rest of you? I have one museum curator. A lot of people are just not telling me. W what do you do? I work in the National Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. any, any other volunteer information? Okay, thanks. Heritage management. Okay. Anything radically different? What does that mean? <laughs> oh, space plan. Oh, sorry. So, no, I understood special. Oh, I know you, Ermin. Yeah, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I, I, have, I have an idea. I have an idea. Okay, then um, let's see how this thing works. I just looked at the title, Accessibility of Cultural Heritage, so I thought I'd ask three questions. Uh, the first one, what do we mean? Mm. The second one, for whom do we need it? And the third one, is it cost effective? I'm not hearing enough talk about cost and about cost effectiveness. And I'm sorry I have to bring you all down from clouds and put your feet on the ground. We have politicians everywhere telling us that culture is a luxury. And we are not responding to that with the aggression that we should be using. We should be talking about cost effectiveness and the bottom line of the return on investment to come from culture and how it feeds in positively to the economy and to keeping down the costs of social 
malaise, social difficulties. If we don't do that, we will end up talking to our navels. And, we should, and, and that's not a good thing for any of us to be doing. So, this is Article 27.1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. That is the baseline of everything else when we talk about access to cultural heritage. And the, the tendency is to think about people with disabilities as being the ones who need to have access. The, the figures are quite substantial. We have an estimated 16% of the population of the European Union, that's 80 million people, who have some form of disability that is registered by the states in which they live. By the way, that makes it the second largest population in Europe after Germany. Now, if you think about it in those terms, it's quite important, you know? Uh, but I actually, I don't really want to think about it in those terms only. I don't want to think about people being only with disabilities. But before I turn on to the next slide where I talk about that, let's just look at the, the, estimated, the estimate value of accessible tourism, only accessible tourism, without talking about all the rest, 800 billion euros per annum. That source is the United Nations World Tourism Organization. It was quoted uh, at the Accessible Euro Tourism in Europe conference, uh, which I was moderating in, the, in San Marino in uh, November last year. Now, I don't know of any economy at the moment, anywhere in the world, that can afford to say, oh, what's, uh, what's 800 million euros? We don't need that. So we're not doing our job properly if we're not looking at that from an economic point of view. But this, here is the question, is accessibility a question that is only relevant to people with disabilities, recognized by the state? And you know there's a very fine dividing line between the ones who get the recognition and the ones who don't. And what constitutes a disability in one country may not constitute a disability in another one. That's why we have 16% as the estimated total, and it has to be estimated because uh, in some countries it's as low as 4% and in some countries it's as high as 25%. And it's not to say that there is a higher incidence in those countries where there's 25%. It's just that the, f the bureaucratic forms of recognition are organized differently. Well, no, before I go to that, I just want to do a little test with you now, first of all. Would you please stand up? All of you stand up. If you have ever broken a leg or broken an arm, you can sit down. <coughs> right. When you were in that condition, you were temporarily disabled and you knew what it was like to feel that the world was a difficult place to be in. Uh, you're lucky because it doesn't happen to you all the time, but some people have that condition all the time. If you have an elderly parent or grandparent that you take to the doctor or you take shopping or you take to the theater or anything, you can sit down. The reason for that is because when you take an elderly person, when you accompany an elderly person, you have to plan in advance to think about that person's needs. The distances to walk, the frequency of the toilet stops, uh, the possibility to have something to drink. I won't call it coffee because we're talking about your countries and so it's not coffee. But something to drink uh, to, to keep that person going because they need something more frequently. Maybe it may be food, doesn't matter what it is. So you're putting yourself into that position. If uh, th this, this, will, uh, this is a question only for half of the audience. Uh, if you've ever been pregnant and had a child, you can sit down. It wasn't easy, was it, getting around with this thing out here for months and months and then having to cope, cope with having a very small child with unexpected needs all the time actually expected needs because it happens all the time, day and night, it really does change your focus on how you live in the world. The rest of you can sit down. If you're lucky, one day you'll be old. <laughs> and when you get to be old, you'll find out what it's like to be disabled, even if you don't have any piece of paper that says you are. What's the moral of this message? The moral is that disability is not about them those others. It's about all of us at some stage. None of you was born autonomous. 
None of you leapt out of your mother's womb like Venus in the Botticelli painting to say, hey, I'm going off to get a coffee. You all needed assistance. You all needed to be looked after. And it's going to happen again, maybe sometime later on in your life. So the first major barrier to break down in the mind is the barrier between us and them. If you're designing, in a very broad sense of the term, creating a service, creating the best form of service or strategy or position or place, you have to think in terms of inclusiveness, all of us together. Let's not think in terms of disabilities, but think in terms of accessibility to the cultural heritage as something that is needed for everybody. Oh, and by the way, if the cultural heritage, this again, I'm going to say something terribly, terribly bad. If the cultural heritage is not useful for us, it's going to fall to pieces. That was one threat that wasn't on your list this morning. It's going to fall to pieces because we can't afford to keep maintaining it just for the luxury of it. It's going to fall to pieces. So either we use it or it will fall down. Demographic change, and this is what's happening to our world. This, Europe. Look at what is happening here. Let's see if I can get this thing to point properly. No, it, it, doesn't, it does it down here, but it doesn't do it over there. Never mind. <clears throat> you can see those, um, those figures. Our overall population, this is the EU25. Apologies to anybody from uh, the three other member states from Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia. Uh, these are the EU statistics from uh, 2004. We had about 450 million population in 2004, and the uh, Eurostat estimates that we will have 450 million in 2050, with a slight drop, a couple of million, a couple of points. No big disaster, or so it seems, until you start going and breaking down the figures. Let's see if I can get it to, yeah, if I, if I get over here, then you can see the figures a bit more. The working age population, let's say about now, because this hasn't changed so much yet, it has dropped a bit, 67%. 67% are in working age. In 2050, it will only be 57%. That means we will have 50 million people less of working age. 50 million people less capable of working and producing the wealth that keeps our society going. The, the writing is on the wall here. We will have three points less of children. It's small but gradual but continuous and very dangerous. The drop. The elderly double, that is over the, the over 65s, from 16% to about 30%. That's where the extra people are. 60 million extra people over 65 years old. And remember, they need pensions. And those pensions have to be paid. And they have to be paid by the people who are creating the wealth, who are working. So, we start to get a dangerous situation. By the way, the very elderly, the over 80s, will be three times as many, from 4% to nearly 12%. That is rather difficult to think about now. We're not used to that thinking yet, but these are the people who are going to be using the cultural heritage. So we've got to start thinking about making it ready for them, not just for some pie-in-the-sky idea of a 25-year-old male Olympic athlete, which is the usual object for architects and designers of these days. Uh, this is what's happening at the moment and what we are going towards. At the moment, we have one elderly person over 65 for every four people of working age, and we have one child for every four people of working age. What's going to happen is that by 2050, we will have two people of over 65 for every four of working age and one child. So three dependents instead of two for every four of working age. Now comes the truth. In the European Union, something under 50% of people of working age actually work. So at the moment, we don't have two dependents for every four of working age. We have four dependents for every two people working. That's the truth. And in 2050, we can expect it to be five dependents for every two people working. Well, I can tell you that we cannot afford to have that sort of situation without changing things radically in the world we live in. At the moment, we rely on assistance for elderly people because our world is so stupidly designed. Now, 
we, we have a choice in future, either assistance or a pension. You can't have both because we, the, the, the sums simply won't work out. So we have to redesign our world. It's a very simple pro uh, uh, project, but it has to be done. That's what it looks like in Italy, much worse. We have one of the oldest populations in Europe. You can see our dependency ratio at the bottom right, the, 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 the figure in bold, makes it actually seven to eight, which means if we do the, the same calculations before, it will be 11 dependents for every four of working age. It doesn't bear thinking about. And there are some places that are even worse off, Slovakia, for example, because of its uh, dropping population, where the figures are even almost 100% dependency, which means that in practice they can be looking forward to having six people, six dependents for every two people of working age. Uh, and in case you think it's only inside the European Union, it's happening outside as well, even in countries that at the moment still consider themselves to be young, like Turkey. I showed these figures on a couple of occasions in Turkey, a, a, a whole room in the Anya Ma 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 Aula Manya in the university, there were about 500 people there, you could hear a pin drop. It was so silent, they were shocked because they're used to thinking of themselves as a young country. And then they saw this and they were, you could see them thinking, oh my God, <laughs> it's going to happen to us. This is human diversity. I gave you a little exercise, the stand up exercise beforehand. This is human diversity in practice. We did a conference in Milan at the Triennale in 27, and uh, we asked our photographer to go around and ask people in the city whether they would mind being photographed. And this is the sort of thing we see every day. Look how diverse these people are. The people on the streets of Milan. You go into any European town or city and you see this. This is human diversity in practice. And these are the people that we design for. This is my organization, very quickly. We're in 36 members now in 21 European states. We just had to cut out Latvia, unfortunately, because our organization couldn't uh, continue in Latvia. But we're going to be looking for another member. So uh, I'm advertising now. If anybody wants to become a member of our organization, we're open to discuss it. Um, what is design for all then? The design, which is the, the method we use to, uh, to, to tackle these challenges. We respond to this situation. Our founder president, uh, first president, Paul Hogan, in 1993 said, good design enables, bad design disables. And this poster expresses the concept rather well. It's obviously a communication campaign. We did this with ICOGRADA, the International Council of Communication Design, a few years ago during uh, the period of Torino World Design Capital. Uh, and the second part of the slogan disappears into the, into the matrix of the, 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 the poster intentionally because it communicates the idea of what, is, what good design does and what bad design does. Design for all as the response is designed for human diversity, social inclusion and equality. Human diversity is the baseline of the design. We do not design for disabled people. We do not design for women. We do not design for the elderly. We do not design for selected personas. We design for diversity. It has a fantastic advantage as well in the private sector because it increases your baseline of clients. And in the public sector, it increases the usability of your facility because you have more possibility of responding to a broader usership. The aim is to achieve social inclusion and equality of opportunity. How do we do it? By m making conscious use of the analysis of human needs and aspirations and involving users who these days we call experiencers at every stage in the design process. It's not as difficult as it sounds. This is the consultation that you were talking about this morning. The consultation process is a matter of creating an ongoing dialogue. In the, in the urban environment, it's easier to do it because in the urban environment, there is a political responsibility to have a continuous and ongoing dialogue between the citizens and the authorities and the decision makers. It's a little more difficult in the private sector because it has to be created every time ad hoc, but it's not impossible if you're interested in having a good return on investment. And why do we consult with people? Well, because it's quite simple. However expert you are, you don't know. 
You may be an expert designer, you may be an expert architect, but I'm telling you, the fact that you're an, an expert designer means you're good at designing the process. The fact that you're an expert architect means that you're good at designing the building, but it doesn't mean that you're good at knowing what everybody else wants in this world. None of us knows what everybody else wants, what everybody else needs, what we aspire to. And that is why it is not just a choice, it's a responsibility on us to consult, to consult continuously. Now, the classical response has always been in product design and of course also in architecture and I think it's probably quite familiar when we're talking about the cultural heritage, the process of the add-on. Add a bit here for the disabled, add a ramp, add some steps, add a lift, and we already have a struggle sometimes persuading the authorities to allow us to put that ramp in or to put the lift in because they say, oh no, we can't have you destroying that, it's historical. Yeah, it may be historical, but as I say, if it's not going to be used ever because uh, people can't get into it, it's going to fall down. So then you can deal with your historicality afterwards when the thing is falling into a ruin, then we can make a nice ruin out of it. Uh, it's not cost effective to keep on adding bits on. That's the way that it used to be done with, uh, with Microsoft adding on the accessible versions every time when there was a, a new version of the operating system that came out. These days, when the operating systems come out, they are automatically accessible for blind people, for example, because otherwise it's, uh, it's not cost effective to keep on adding on these extra bits and pieces. And the same thing happens with products and with places. Now, I'm rushing a little bit to give some, to give some different inputs into you so that I leave you with your minds, uh, I hope, a little bit in turmoil. These are our concepts of city. We need to realize that we change our concepts of city all the time. I have dozens of photographs of cities all over the place. Every one of them reflects some individual's idea of what a city is. And they are so radically different that it's almost laughable. But I'm just going to stick to one city here. That's the same place a thousand years later. Same con different concept, same city. And that's the same one again in the early 20th century. There are three different views of three different areas in Rome. You can't talk about Rome and say it's just the one place. The concept, the, whole, the, the, the entire concept of how a city is made has changed so radically over the years, over the centuries, that all of those come into it an awful lot more as well, because I haven't shown you the neighborhoods all those dreadful areas built in the 60s and 70s on the outskirts of Rome, which are, and, and, well, like many, the outskirts of many cities in Italy, are the na national shame that we have. But we have to consider this diversity. And this is our obsession all the time. <coughs> I, I, it's probably uh, quite familiar to you. It's, uh, it's a, a screenshot from Fritz Lang's uh, Metropolis. But if you think <laughs> that that is an obsession that's historical, just think about that. Because that's another obsession that we have now as well, where we're putting everything into machines, 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 and we expect the people to adapt to this. Well, I have news for you. We don't have to adapt anymore. What we have to do is adapt that stuff to make it suit us. And the sooner we start doing it, the better. Because this is the bottom line of the message. People come first. The slogan of our conference in Helsinki, the Helsinki World Design Capital in 2012, there I am moderating the conference in the middle, the, the final discussion panel. In the end, why did we build the Mercato Traiano in Rome? Why did we build the Vatican? Why did we build the Eur? Why did we build anything? We didn't build it so that we could stick a label on it, don't touch. We built it because people wanted to use it when the, it was built, at the time when it was built. People come first. Now, I'm not saying let's all, belong, let's all go and join ISIS and knock everything down that's pre-Islam because it's no use to us. Obviously, that's an extreme message, and I don't want to be misinterpreted to be taken to that point. It's very easy if I don't start putting the, the, the provisos down that I could be accused of being... Uh, of being in favor of dem demolishing everything that isn't accessible. That's not the truth, that's not the message. But we have to come to, to, ter to terms with reality, and reality is that it's people that it's all about. People first. 
and the buildings are the things where, uh, where people do things. And let's also remember that not everybody wants to live in a big city. So here I'm coming to, to, my, to my conclusion now. I'm just going to show you a couple of little projects that I've launched. This one I launched in, uh, in Roccarazzo, a small town in the middle of the Apennines in central Italy last year. Uh, Roccarazzo, like many other places, risks losing its sedentary population. Lots of small towns risk losing their population. Small towns that have schools, that have housing and have shops, they lose the population. These people go to the big cities where we have to build new housing, new shops, new schools, new hospitals. So we have to duplicate an infrastructure that already exists. It doesn't make much sense, but we're doing it all the time. We need to kick back and say, no, hang on, uh, this is also part of our cultural heritage. The cultural heritage of living in the places where our ancestors lived, it's fine for me to say that. I mean, I'm, I'm half English, half German, I've been living in Italy 36 years, and every, every generation somebody changes a country in my family, so don't look at me. <laughs> but I'm very attached to this side of the cultural heritage in all the countries where I've lived and worked. We need to consider the difficulties that these small places have. We need to create programs between us to network, to enable people to stay in these places, to have a quality of life, and to attract money, put, to put it in a very vulgar way, attract economy in from the larger population areas outside. And that's what we can do with a network that we're trying to create now here, small towns for all. Obviously, when we say for all, we're talking about the idea of these towns being accessible and comparing their accessibility achievements between themselves year after year, but also comparing how they will manage to attract tourism, attract culture, and, uh, and maintain their economic base. And this one is so new, we don't even have a corporate identity for it yet. Last week, we launched it, the Games of Magna Grecia in the, in the south of Italy on the Ionian coast. This will be Olympic and Paralympic athletics games together. And again, the idea is to bring people back and keep them there in the south of Italy, an area which has always been losing population to the bigger cities to the north. We need to find ways for people to stay there. And this is again, another project for us to do this. The two most frequent barriers we have are it can't be done and it's too expensive. The first is an error in design thinking. There's no such thing as it can't be done. If, you're, if, you're response, if, if, if some decision maker tells you it can't be done, all it means is he's looking at it the wrong way. You've got to step back, look at it from a different angle. It can be done differently. And the second is an error in accounting practice. As this guy here said, I found this economics in one lesson. The art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the long t longer effects of any act or policy. So it's not just about the money. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. So it's not only about getting the, the return on investment immediately, but also about avoiding the expenses that you would have if you don't invest. And if you remember what I told you about demographic change, there are many big expenses that we will have if we don't invest on changing our world. Design is not the product, it's the method. And when we create medium and long-term strategies for Europe's recovery, design for all morphs into experience-based strategic design. And a well-designed strategy is what Europe needs, and God knows that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And if you allow me, uh, I would like to, to read one more sentence that I found that you told that I believe very firmly that when properly and um, uh, when properly uh, very firmly when properly understood design is the major force of social innovation. Yes. It's your word. Oh. I don't want to take too much time from the next speaker. I'm very conscious of that. So I'm, uh, it's, it's a matter of how we look upon our thinking process. Uh, 
Design is not the fine products, the fine articles that you see. Uh, design is the method, it's the translation of a well-conceived idea in the brain into the process that then makes, that, makes it happen. Uh, social innovation is, 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 uh, is simply part of that process. Without a design thinking, a design methodology, it cannot happen. Uh, I could go on for a couple of hours about it, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We are running now to moving to Amsterdam, and it's enormous pleasure to introduce you, Mr. Art Oxenar. He, is, uh, he worked for the Netherlands Architecture Institute in Rotterdam. Uh, he, is, uh, he has been director of the Amsterdam Ac Academy of uh, Architecture. He is active in advisory and he is uh, in all planning processes. And now uh, 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 Art is one of the key persons in Amsterdam related to accessibility, cultural heritage, and many other things, right? I'm director of the Bureau for Monuments and Archaeology, so we are responsible for 9,000 monuments, yes. <laughs> Only this, please. Uh, sort of. Yeah. Sorry. Sort of. Thank you very much. This is going to be, on the one end, a very, very different story. I don't quite know how these teams were selected. It's very much in practice, but then listening to the two of you, uh, I can relate to it quite directly, because, uh, Martin, you were talking about uh, points of transition, I think what we'll be looking at is very much about points of transitions, about platforms for social interaction, and use what exists to create what is to be. So three points that are extremely important in what I will show from a very practical point of view in a changing city. But also the us and them theme, I think is very important. Inclusiveness, uh, good design enables. I think that is a very important point I hope to show uh, by using uh, many examples, maybe too many, and uh, the changing concepts of cities, how we pile one upon the other. As Rem Kohl has said already quite a few years ago, we should stop reinventing our cities all the time. And as Alison and Peter Smithson said, we should accept the city as found and start there. So that's, I think, two important points that will uh, play a role in my story. And then, of course, I guess the most important one, people come first. That's in the end what we do it about. So my story will be very much about uh, the influence of the way we move through our cities uh, on the way we uh, relate to our heritage and then especially the changes in the way we move. And we can say, if I may be a bit short in an historical analysis, that the 20th century was the century of the car, of getting our cities accessible for cars. If we're lucky, the, 20th, the 21st century you showed this wonderful picture uh, with the highway in, at night, is going to be the age of public transport, of bicycles, and of pedestrians. And that's definitely what's happening in Amsterdam, and that's what most of my examples will be about. Just to give you an idea of our city, I could talk here for an hour about the changing urban concepts. Amsterdam is pretty much like textbook city. There are a few cities where you can see these concepts of the last century, the one after the other. But I will deal more specifically with two examples, one and two related to subway lines, and the other three related to specific locations in the city where a change in the way we access them, changes in accessibility, changed enormously the way uh, we relate to our heritage. This will be the first line I'll deal with. I don't know how familiar these kinds of actions are to you, but this was Amsterdam in the 1960s when we were making a new access, I'm sorry, this is going a bit too fast, when we were making a new four-lane highway that was supposed to disclose to make the city center accessible and that cuts all the way through the 19th century to the 17th century into the medieval times, ending here at this amazing building in the heart of the 16th century city, tearing down uh, pretty much everything that came on its way because at that point uh, the four-lane highway also was combined with a subway line and the only way to build a subway line at those times was by making concrete caissons that were slowly sinking into the ground so everything had to be torn down including this kind of streets. This was the traditional radial 
connecting Amsterdam with the outside world. And this is what it looked like after the subway line was finished. But at this point, while we were fighting to save this building, the tide was turned. The idea was stopped that a four-lane highway would go all the way through the city to the central station. Uh, the subway did continue. And in the end, the subway maybe saved our life in this neighborhood. One part was already in the 80s reconstructed, Stadtreparatur, in the sense of Rob Krier, done by Aldo van Eyck and a group of his pupils. But it wasn't until the 90s that also the second part of the street uh, was much improved, got back a little bit of its original uh, uh, position, thanks to the coming of the Amsterdam School of the Arts. The subway brought new people into the city, brought young people into them, and good access was essential. The state changed the uh, scholarships for students, gave them less money, but did give them a public transport card. More and more students live at home, so public transport is very important for them to come to school. And all of a sudden now you see that schools, universities take places that are well connected, that are very well accessible. And that seems to save this traffic access uh, in Amsterdam. This street began to look like this one. The Rembrandt House now has a slightly better connection to uh, the urban structure. Uh, Close to the next station, we see some very interesting small interventions where a closed garden is opened up to the street by a tea pavilion, but where student housing, one uh, for a long time considered one of the villains is this whole, in this whole process of the destruction of the city, is now in fact a listed monument. It's uh, an early work by Hermann Herzberger, yeah. uh, and very much liked by the students. So we slowly see the life coming back into the city by the changing way we move. The big part we're working on at the moment <coughs> now is this. If you ask any, anybody around 40 and older in Amsterdam, what is the most horrible or ugliest street in Amsterdam, it'll be this one. But if you ask my children, it'll be probably their most popular street because of the changes that has happened there thanks to uh, the subway in the last few years. This is what it looked like in the 60s, 70s. Keep an eye on this big one. We are taking a liking for it now, but the liking came too late. It was torn down. This one was saved, though, as was this one. Long time considered as, uh, let's say, the rather Stalinist phase of Dutch traditionalism of the 1930s. But again, thanks to this combination of subway and uh, students, accessibility, the University of Amsterdam bought the two of them and made them, excuse me, made them into a new campus. So it's coming to be a very publicly accessible site. This used to be the main tax office. Nobody ever wanted to enter. Now there's 25,000 students a day coming in. No so all of a sudden, abolished. there's a whole new life. Sorry? No wonder people wanted to knock it. Right, right, right. <laughs> Nobody ever wanted to get in. It was a rather dantesque yeah. threshold that kept you out. Mm. Uh, and extremely important here was the redesign of public space to make this four-lane highway into an attractive space to be with, as you can see, lots of room for bicycles, room for pedestrians, and very serious attempts by the designers to make the space for cars as small as possible. It was a very political discussion, both with politicians and with traffic designers, they fought literally over every centimeter to get as much green in there, as much trees in there, as they possibly could. could. It succeeded quite well. Ton Schaap, his name should be mentioned here, great designer, but also a great man in playing the complicated uh, decision structures in the city of Amsterdam to get something as simple as a straight row of trees done. And this whole uh, reappraisal, this uh, of the, of the street led to a new liking for the buildings along them. This was an empty school building. We didn't quite know what to do with it. neo Corbusian late 50s, until a new grammar school that's coming up said, hey, that's an interesting, sexy building on the right location. We'll take it. So now it's a school. The same happened with this one. The newspapers moved out of the city center in the 1970s, put up some rather heavy office buildings. For us, these look a bit Gloomy, although it is Barkema, one of the leading figures in Team 10. But for the younger generation, uh, it is their most 
popular club ever. Thanks to the crisis, these buildings remained. When the um, newspapers moved out again, they moved to new industrial areas. The developers didn't know what to do with them. They opened them up, uh, offered them to uh, young startups, to creatives, and uh, gave room for a club in the bottom part of the building. It was much more than a club. There were also uh, exhibitions. There were workshops done there. So for my son, Club Trau is very much part of his heritage, of his layer in the city, the way he looks at it. They would stand in line for hours to get into the club. So all of a sudden, buildings that for my generation looked gloomy. This is the one across the street. It was my first job as a student. I was a doorman there. Never been so bored <laughs> as in that building. But for a younger generation, it became a place also that was opened up for startups. It had a wonderful club and restaurant on the top. And in the end, it resulted, we also need money, cost effective, yeah. in an investor that said, hey, maybe I can reuse this. He made it into a hotel, combined with workspaces, meeting places, and again, this club on the roof was an, an amazing view over the city. And you see both suits like me and the students coming there and doing their work. Oh, sorry, yes, I'm so sorry. The next one is, again, a subway line cutting through Amsterdam, taking uh, a lot of the historic city center. But this time we have a new system of building, so we build underground. Not a single monument is touched. Mm -hmm. The trauma of this first subway line is so big in Amsterdam that for a long time we would speak about a high-speed tramway. We didn't dare even use the word anymore. But now, since there is this new technique, we can do it without any damage. The only open pit constructions are for the stations, and they're very carefully positioned in between our heritage. And that gives us the possibility to regain public space. This is the section of this four-lane highway that was built, that connected along the central station. And this is what it will look like when the new subway line is finished. So we're regaining a lot of public space. And the major entry into Amsterdam will be a pedestrian entry. No more cars, uh, pedestrians, bikes, and a little bit of cars to keep the damn square accessible. This is an interesting case in point. This building was put up in the 1980s. I've seen it being built with the excuse that cost effective, we had to allow the big banks to stay in the city center. Yeah. They'd always say, if you don't give us room to build, we'll move out. And then there will be no more jobs in the city center. Those were, in fact, uh, highly administrative jobs. The computer made them all obsolete, mm -hmm. so they moved out anyway. Yeah. Now we have a building that is very difficult to use because the floor height is not right, mm -hmm. and the original structure of the street is heavily damaged. Mm -hmm. It's being torn down, not very sustainable, but uh, it gave us the possibility to bring back some of the parcellation, the original parcellation, add an alley, and have the right floor height for publicly accessible buildings. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a lot of shops because right in front of the building is the train station, the subway station being made, so it's going to be very expensive ground. Tiny detour, but also an element of accessibility. Together with the building of the subway line, uh, some 20 archaeologists were, building, were working continuously. They brought up some 800,000 objects from mobile telephones to prehistoric objects. All of a sudden, we found that Amsterdam is, as a settlement, thousands of years older than we thought. Here they are working, making images of the former bed of the river. But the theme here of accessibility is that in the station, there will be an exhibition here, a cascade of objects designed by a French artist to connect the people also to this world that was under the city that they're walking on. Then the last section of this subway line crossing the UNESCO World Monument. Uh, as you can see, that city had already been, oh, sorry, that street had already been redesigned in the 1920s and 30s. This was the 17th century version. That was the early 20th century version. These kind of gloomy newspaper pictures were also there to show the anger of many people that also in that time there was this intrusion in our uh, uh, compact city. 
this was considered to be one of the worst intrusions ever in 17th century Amsterdam. But with the renewed red carpet, this red carpet on top of the, the subway line will co uh, continue all the way along the line. We see also a new valuation, a new uh, liking of these historical buildings. From, art historian, for the, from the point of view of art historians, this was already uh, re-evaluated in the 1960s and 70s, but now the general public is beginning to like it. And we did, and here design is very important. We made two intrusions, we made two shop windows. We opened the building, it was a bank, so nobody ever got in there, it was totally inaccessible. Long sections of the streets were inaccessible. By uh, redesigning the interior, Klaus and Kahn architects did that. It became a very public, well accessible buildings. We happen to have our offices in there. And this is the new shop window we made, which is now being used for a World Heritage podium. So this is where we inform people about the World Heritage in the Netherlands, both from the inside and the outside. If there's somebody giving an explanation from the red carpet, you will be able to see what's going on there. So the plint in the street is coming alive. And the most surprising thing is this one, an intruder from the 1960s, always number one or number two on these most hated buildings in the city lists. Recently a project developer bought it and although it's not listed or anything, he, re he renovated the whole building almost in a restorative manner. So here we see a new liking coming with a very important element here again the ground floor is coming alive. Again, this space is, this is one of these office concepts where you can hire a table or a room or a whole office, whatever you want, for an hour or a day or a week. And the whole bottom will be restaurant, meeting room. So a whole new way of working is taking over these monstrous bank buildings of the 70s, reconnecting us to those buildings. Okay, I'll quickly go through three more individual cases on the edge of the historical town of the UNESCO World Heritage. A former gas factory, wonderful 19th century industrial monuments, derelict ever since the 19, late 1960s, heavily polluted ground, nobody knew what to do with it. A competition was made and three connections were made to connect this area of the gas factory to an existing park. A connection for bikes, a connection for pedestrians and a new bridge connecting it to the neighborhood. And step by step, the park came alive. But essential here is the human factor. The way it was done and the way it was developed. The city was responsible for the park. A project developer had the did a casco restoration, just the facades and the roofs, left the interiors pretty much as they were. And, and that was, of course, quite luxurious. Took some time. He wasn't. Uh, hasty in finding clients and renting it out. And the essential part here was a lady called Lisbeth Janssen, who was what we could call a regisseur, a director. She spent years carefully finding the right people to work here. So now it's a combination of television studios, of uh, theater companies, of restaurants and bars. So it's a very lively cultural place in the city. The park is an amazing success gas tank becomes pond, the buildings are reused, quite a few manifestations. But again, essentially, the fact is that quite a bit of the original structure is left, and by organizing by the right direction in what functions do we want here, who do we want to meet who, uh, it came alive, and it is in fact quite cost effective. Very recent example is this former uh, Streetcar Depot, derelict for the last 20 years, enormous battle, especially with the neighborhood. In the planning, uh, the planners had lost connection with the people living around it. Enormous protests came about, said, what's going to happen in our neighborhood? What are you going to do here? What are these megalomaniac plans we see come by? And so the one after the other uh, plan was turned down. Politicians, quite a few got in trouble. Interestingly enough, here it was the designer. It was the architect who saved the day. He was, he's quite a rare type, but he's the kind of guy who will organize the whole process with the neighborhood, with possible users. 
uh, with finances. He ended even up financing part of it himself. He put his family money into it to show that this process for him was uh, worthwhile. But the essential part was the redesign of the building, connecting it to the street. What you see here used to be a closed building. It used to be a railway detail, uh, depot. Now there's a public street connecting in a loop uh, an existing shopping street, an existing market, and this new building. So by reconnecting uh, a long time closed building to the neighborhood, all of a sudden it's extremely alive. There are markets, there's a food court, there's a, a movie theater that's running very well at the moment. The last example. Anybody know this one? What is the Rijksmuseum? Any tourist, I think, would know it. The Rijksmuseum. Rijksmuseum, right. <laughs> but the point here is this one. It has been called Museum Square forever, but it never was a Museum Square. It was the kind of place where you didn't quite know where you were. Uh, it was designed by Cornelis van Eesteren, the Siam, a major man, who thought this was going to be a central uh, traffic node in Amsterdam. And the people from Amsterdam used to call this the shortest highway in Europe. It was a <laughs> four lane, you could race from nowhere to nothing because it wasn't leading anywhere. So nobody really wanted to be there. So competition came, uh, redesign was done. Sunning Anderson from uh, Denmark won the competition, did a very simple and effective thing, made a somewhat more formal part connecting to the Rijksmuseum and a very informal part that could develop into like a public green or the reception room of the city of Amsterdam. And that had a very interesting effect on these monumental buildings around them. Stedelijk Museum, Van Gogh Museum, Rijksmuseum. When they found out how popular all of a sudden this space could be, they began to rethink their position. The, the Stedelijk Museum had been thinking for a long time about extension, and always the idea was their front door would remain along this street, and this would be the extension. Alvaro Siza made designs for it, Venturi made designs for it, but all with an orientation here. When they saw this happening, they thought, we've got to turn around. So the new ex entrance is on the other side now. They turned towards the square, mm -hmm. opening up to where the people are, yeah. opening up to where it's happening. Yeah. And they made a very modern design, but connecting with the carefully restored historic building. And then the one after the other came. This egg was given uh, by a Japanese insurance company to Hong Kong Museum, to It was just an extension. It went in from here. Now they're turning around. They want to enter here to connect to the Zinong's reception room for the city of Amsterdam. And the same happened to the Rex Museum. So that had two formal entrances here on the city side, let's say, of the building. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Be it much against the will of the architect, there was a, an underpass, and the architect had always wanted you to go in the underpass, then into the building, and then go up, so you slowly leave the city and then move up to the arts. The king didn't want that. He couldn't imagine that such an important building had, didn't have a door on the street. But with a recent renovation uh, by Cruz and Ortiz architects, the dream of the architect was realized. The passage was restored, it was opened on both sides, and a wonderful central entrance hall was created, enabling people now to come in from two sides. It's not a one-sided building anymore, it's a building accessible from two sides. So what we see here, to sum up all the, all the examples, that careful public design, careful redesign of public space can be very helpful in Relate, in relating us to our heritage or renewing our relating, uh, relation to that heritage in Amsterdam. Do I have one more minute? Yes. Because I did a little something. Yes. I was listening to uh, Alexandra Watt yesterday and she came up with uh, her, uh, what did she call it, the magic formula for uh, saving monuments and she was talking about the X factor. So I tried to think, maybe also for the discussion, it's interesting, what could be the X factor in each of these projects? Or what is the X factor in each of these projects? So you could say in the Weesperstraat, Diebertstraat, it's students. 
the right generation of people coming in there and bringing the, the street back alive with a bit of help of the crisis, which slowed down too fast development, redevelopment of buildings. In the Rode Loper, the, the red carpet running through the historic center, uh, I would say it's the plinth. Room for pedestrians and accessibility, scale, small scale life in the plinth of the building. So something will happen when you pass by there. There's a you and me. In the Vesta Park, it's a patient developer and this one lady, a regisseur, who really thinks about what do we want to happen here? Who are we going to bring here as a commercial par partner? How are we going to make this cost effective and publicly effective? And the same very much so goes for uh, the former railway depot, uh, 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 streetcar depot. Again, very much think about who is coming here, what do we want to do here, and how do we connect it to the people of the neighborhood? And the last one, in that sense, maybe is interesting because of the word design. I would say the Museum Plain is the one where the most uh, influence was from the design. Here it was Sven Ingmar Andersen, who with his design showed what a place like this can be and how it can function, and that made everybody rethink his or her position around the square. So maybe this can be an opening for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. I think that we all are so much inspired. We so discovered how huge, how important, how, uh, how essential, in a way, is uh, the, our team of heritage, cultural heritage, uh, contemporary design, accessibility. So it opened us, for us the, the scope that we are not talking, when we are talking about historic parks and gardens, we are not talking about roses, but much more <laughs> important things. So uh, we are very much um, in time. Uh, it is one o'clock uh, and according to our um, uh, regular, it's lunchtime. <laughs> so what do you think about it? Maybe if it's good or bad idea to have a lunch now? <laughs> <laughs> and what about questions? What about discussion? If we have something important question, let's do it now. If you have it, yes, one. Good morning, Anna Sinova from Polish Ministry of Culture. I have a very short question actually to uh, Sir from Italy. Sorry, I uh, didn't memorize your name correctly. Um, it was interesting for me, well, all our presentation was very interesting, but particularly uh, interesting uh, was the, one of the la latest things you, you uh, said about this um, economy uh, uh, of invest, uh, cultural investments and uh, that uh, often we uh, all we only see how expensive this investment is but we should f uh, look as it uh, and it as a long term investment in fact that will pay off in a longer period and uh, not only from economic point of view but also in all social uh, aspects is there any good solution or or, or methods to to help uh, measure that kind of investments because it's always difficult for um, cultural and entrepreneurs, let's say, or also uh, not on, only from heritage uh, field, to to justify the, that their their project is actually an investment. I I, I <laughs> suffer for you. I know exactly what you mean. Um, it's a little bit like another situation in parallel. A good design is one that nobody notices, and a bad design is one that we immediately notice because we trip over it, because it makes mistakes for us. We're not the ones making mistakes, by the way. It's the design that makes mistakes when it's bad. Um, <clears throat> the sort of situation you need is to find a way of measuring something that doesn't happen. Because uh, what we need to what, what we need to uh, to measure maybe is the social decay, the cost of social decay of a neighbourhood, 
and to theorize how much it would have cost us to have made a cultural intervention in that neighborhood. And then we can only theorize, of course, whether that would have had the economic impact that we, that, that we predict. But we can compare situations where, where nothing is done and situations where something is done. We've had some very good examples shown to us just now from Amsterdam. Situations where if they had been left in decay, they may have caused the kind of social disgregation that we know from other cities in other parts of Europe, in other parts of the world. Those are hotbeds for social discontent and social cost. Every time we leave things to decay, there is a social cost, not just, a, not just an infrastructural cost. Uh, by not intervening, we leave things to fester. We cause the social tensions. Uh, let's be quite clear about it. We're living in a Europe at the moment where borders are beginning to arise where there were no borders 10 years ago where we are rediscovering discrimination. We are rediscovering the populism of uh, easily led groups of, the, of um, politicians, the, the unscrupulous politicians, because not all politicians are like this, but the unscrupulous politicians who are prepared to use any lever to get themselves into a position of power. They are capable of doing that they're capable of building on social fears because of the context in which they preach. I can tell you about situations in Italy where the Northern League, which has uh, its tradition of being racist in the north of Italy, is now beginning to export its racism to the center and south of Italy, which seems to be impossible because they've always preached against the center and south of Italy. And yet they are using this same method now to preach against immigration. And how can they do this? They can do it because there is a perception of decay and poverty in certain areas, not everywhere in the center and south of Italy, but they go and they target those places where there is decay and poverty. So if we allow decay and poverty to continue, we are building extremely expensive models for us in future. How much is it going to cost us in the future to undo all the damage we have done or we have allowed to be done by the reconstruction of discrimination, the reconstruction of racism, the reconstruction of borders? That is an enormous cost. It's going to cost us billions. The relatively small cost, a small, almost indistinguishable, tiny cost of cultural and social interventions in those places to alleviate the tension now, anybody but the most arrant idiot would have to understand that that is the place to spend money. Unfortunately, the type of people that we're governed by don't understand it. I don't have to say what I think about them. Thank you very much. Maybe Art, you would like uh, to add something? Well, you make it into a very political story, which of course it is. You're absolutely it is, right. Yes. But, but you should use but, the mic. Uh, yes, sorry. So, we should be uh, careful about decay and poverty, but I think one step could be too fast if indeed we immediately uh, connect decay or emptiness or unuse of specific or not being used, uh, uh, the, la the lack of use for specific locations in the city. Uh, and see them as a danger, that might lead to the fact that the moment there is no investment, we tear them down, we clear them out. So I think there's something in between, and that's what I showed in the examples, and well, we all know them. The moment you see this risk of decay that might lead to poverty, might lead to the decay of a whole neighborhood, find ways for a bottom-up reuse and a bottom-up revitalization. We all know the story about Soho in New York. The first time I got there in the 70s, you didn't want to be there after dark. There was artists living there. They revitalized the whole thing. They kept it alive when it might already have been broken down. And that's only one example. Now, well, we all know what it is now. So I think it's very important to think about strategies, not only about money and investment, but also think about strategies for reuse. I've seen industrial complexes outside of Budapest, impossible locations, uh, decay, et cetera, et cetera. But young people moving in, building bikes, artists moving in, and all of a sudden the life comes in there. So there is a bit of a social life, and they can become points from where the redevelopment begins. 
and invested, investors might follow. We've seen that so often. So let's not be too quick to say if heritage is out of use and there's decay in poverty around it, let's clear it. Let's find strategies to reuse them. Yeah, I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want to be the one who seems to be bombing everything. No, uh, that's not the idea. Uh, and maybe I'm, I'm putting a lot of focus on the importance of the economic side because I know how weak it is, uh, how weak the cultural agenda is in terms of getting funding compared to other agendas. Uh, but uh, I mean, Art just used the, 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 the absolutely essential word for me, which is bottom up. But we have to have enabling processes in place so that bottom up can happen. And the fact is that if we look around Europe, in some countries they are there, in other countries they are not. <coughs> so we do need to have enabling processes. We have to enable young people to go in without finding that everything is blocked, without being told by the police they have to go away, they have no business to be there. We have to find more flexible planning solutions, more flexible strategies to, en to enable people to do things from bottom up without automatically having the, the health and safety people or the, the tax authorities coming along and telling them, you can't do this, you can't do that. We, we, we have a culture of no in, in too many countries in Europe where the first, in case of doubt, don't do anything. Uh, we don't get anywhere that way. So maybe this is an important message as well. We need to have a culture of try a culture of be prepared to make a mistake and the state is not going to come and, and beat you for trying to make a and, and maybe making a mistake on the way. We need a culture of possibility. Thank you very much. Martin, maybe even maybe you will add something? <coughs> um, my pleasure, yes. Um, it's stupid. Uh, it's economy. Um, it's, 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 it's economy. economy. Yeah. Yeah. I must say I'm, I'm very, very happy about this stupidity because it's so easy to calculate. And um, I, might, I might finish with a very espresso story. I know you are starving in the same way as me. No, it's, ah, it was Italian, it was espresso. <laughs> we call it coffee. Um, a story from, from Latvia, from the design school, secondary class, 15 to 18 years old. And um, they, the professor went to the uh, ladies' jail, the prison for ladies in Riga, and asked 18 of these ladies there to write a letter where they express their feelings. They had 18 letters of feelings and presented anonymously to 18 arts students and asked them, according to the content and uh, the feelings in this letter, to draw a portrait of these ladies in jail. They didn't know that these are ladies in jail, this was just a letter of a lady. And then they matched the letter the portrait and the real ladies and they met in jail, which is a fantastic arts project in jail. They had a fantastic time, happiness, tears, respect, value, dignity, whatever you can imagine. This was the art story, happiness. The nice story could be, if we calculate the costs of how to stabilize people in jail, not to refall back again in a pattern they have already experienced. Is this a measure, is this a tool to save a lot of public money because in most of the cases these ladies visit this jail three times, four times, five times. If this is an alternative, then the costs of bringing eight portraits to the jail is much, much cheaper for the society than just bring them back five times again. And that's it. And you can calculate very, very easy. Exactly. Yeah. Stupid economy. <laughs> Happy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, if you allow me, I would like on behalf of all of us to thank our <coughs> speakers, uh, Art, Pete, and uh, Martin for this wonderful presentations and excellent time that we shared at all the news that we, uh, you, 
that we studied and uh, we have experienced. And thank you very much for your participation, your knowledge, and uh, your sharing with us uh, of your experiences and what you, you, you showed for us and what, what you shared for us. Thank you very much and thank, we thank also Latvian Presidency and State Inspector, Inspection for Cultural Heritage to bringing us to he together to understand better the topic and to, to spread this information in our um, respective countries. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, can, I, can I thank the technicians and translators, please? Thank you. <laughs>